Hello and welcome to worship at Trinity St. Paul's United Church. My name is Laura Gallagher Doucette. I am a member here and a candidate for ordination in the United Church, currently studying at Emmanuel College. As we gather in this holy place, we recognize that for thousands of years, this territory has been a sacred gathering place for many people of Turtle Island. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of several Indigenous nations and wish to pay special recognition to the Mississaugas of the credit. The original nations continue to cry out for justice. As treaty people, we commit to listen, learn, and work to right the wrongs of the past and present. It is crucial that we understand the ways in which our tradition's history continues to be used as an instrument of ongoing colonization in this land. For hundreds of years, the Christian church has contributed to unjust and oppressive conditions for many marginalized peoples. Until we cut new covenants with all those harmed by the sins of the church, the prospect of living in right relation will remain impossible. I am a settler here in Toronto. My ancestors are Acadian, French, Irish, and German, some of whom have occupied this land from as early as the 1600s. I am grateful for the way this land houses and nourishes my body and my soul. I invite you to consider all the ways in which the land takes care of you and how you might better take care of the land. Good morning. Our first hymn this morning is in Voices United 391. Please join Andrew and I in singing God Reveal Your Presence. Purify my spirit. 
A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north, and to the south, and all of the families in the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that, had, that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I mentioned in my welcome earlier in the service, the Christian church, including the United Church of Canada, possesses a colonial history. We know that Christian run institutions, such as the residential school system, have been inextricable from the ongoing colonial project that is the country of Canada. And while residential schools have not operated as such for over 20 years, we also know that the effects of this system still do operate in this country on personal and institutional levels, such as in our foster care system. Likewise, other arms of the state, including the so-called justice system, and all levels of our country's police were forged in the same colonial kiln that brought this country into being. In Paul's sermon on the parable of the sower last week, he brought Jesus's words to the context of today's social uprising against anti-Black racism. The seed that falls on good earth in today's context is the kingdom of God in the hearts and hands of the individual committed to strong and sustained action 
against white supremacy. With this commitment in mind, I invite us to turn a critical post-colonial eye to the last line of today's first lectionary reading, the story of Jacob's Ladder. The line is, he called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz. This final line may seem innocuous. It makes sense that Jacob names this site Bethel, which means the house of God, given the magnitude of his vision. From one perspective, renaming Luz Bethel is simply a description of reality rather than a decision on Jacob's part that we might critique. Had the Lord not made it clear that this was the gate of heaven? And if the Lord had made it clear, what is the basis for argument from Jacob or from us? Why must we examine this text through a post-colonial lens? In this ongoing season of difficult questions and great uncertainty, is no well-intentioned wellspring free from the contamination of colonization and white supremacy? After all, how many of us have renamed significant places in our lives? Is that such a sin? One such place comes to mind for me. When my family used to camp in Algonquin Park on Lake Kayaskoski, we always paddled to Blueberry Island, an island small enough that it only contained one campsite. It was the perfect size. My brother and I could ramble around the entirety of it unchaperoned, even from the time we were six and eight years old. The site was called Blueberry Island because it was covered in blueberry bushes the fruit of which my brother and I ate plenty of as we explored the landscape together. Beyond the fun of picking the fruit, the proliferation of berries felt mythological to my young mind because of my dad's stories of camping in Algonquin Park as a teenager with one of his friends. The stories of his trip involved much improvising, some risky canoeing, and fresh blueberries picked to be mixed into the scant dry goods they'd packed for pancakes in the morning. Picking blueberries in Algonquin Park was to do as my father had done. The tradition felt familial, as natural as the name of the place. But if you look up Blueberry Island, you won't find it on a map. That's because although the site is Blueberry Island to the Gallagher Doucettes, we were the ones who named it. As I prepared for today, I called to my dad and said, hey dad, how old were Elliot and I when we used to camp on Kiosk? He replied, what? You mean on Blueberry Island? <laughs> Blueberry Island for us is the only name of the place. It is a description, not a decision about the way things are. The point I'm trying to make is that the act of renaming is a common way people claim connection to the places and experiences of their lives. Sometimes these actions seem benign or even useful. Other times they do not. Can we think of Jacob's act fondly the way I might think of Blueberry Island? When are these actions trivial? And when are they part and parcel? of a large and calculated trend. A particularly important moment in my faith formation happened years ago in this sanctuary. This was back when Hal and Karen were our ministers, to give some of you more context. I was up in the balcony, in the same pew where my family still gravitates towards when we worship here in person. But neither Hal nor Karen preached that Sunday morning. The message delivered from the pulpit that Sunday was from a residential school survivor. As a young child, I had never heard such openness about the genocide in these lands. My young mind tried to understand the things this man said about his childhood growing up here in this country. The violence he spoke of was vivid, but deeply removed from my scope of experience 
despite the fact that the lineage of my family and my faith had constructed the systems he spoke of. I began to learn about the relationship between Christianity, colonization, and Canada. I imagined explorers who set out from Europe, tangling greed and force into a peaceful tradition. Though I'm sure I didn't have this language as a child, it seemed ironic to me. Like a huge mistake or misunderstanding. Why and how could this happen when the Christian message was one of love? It was later that I came to understand that it was not hundreds, but thousands of years ago that religion and colonization became intertwined. And that the evidence for this was not only in how the texts were used, but in the very texts themselves. That is to say, I thought of Columbus, Cartier, and Cortez long before I would have recognized the name Canaan. Today's reading is an obvious example of a colonial text deep in the origin of our faith. This passage is from the book of Genesis, the first book in Hebrew scriptures. Most scholars believe that the various parts of Genesis were written 3,000 years ago. In other words, this is nothing new. Not only does our tradition sprout colonial branches, it has colonial roots. In just chapters, after God had created the heavens and the earth, God's chosen people were exercising power over others in the name of their Lord. The question of how these other enemy people had come into being is, of course, not discussed in the text. It is much more than an unthinking action on Jacob's part that reveals this history. In fact, some scholars argue that the larger narrative of Hebrew scriptures is one of ethnic cleansing against the Canaanite population. If it seems as though this is solved when Jesus shows up, I urge you to remember that you don't need to look far in the New Testament to find where those texts proclaim the one and only truth. Is it surprising then? that so many settler colonial enterprises operate under the auspice of religion, using the Bible as a proof text for their right to indigenous land? Was it a big misunderstanding, like I thought when I was a kid? Or is this truth more insidious, more inherent to our faith? When Jacob renames Luz the house of God, he names it the house of his God, the God of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham, from whom the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam get their name. That is to say, Jacob's God is the God that we, in our monotheistic tradition, continue to worship today. These texts are ancient, yes, but their legacy is alive and well. So, what are we supposed to do with this? Where in this exploration is the good news you have come here to hear today? I personally believe that it would be a cop out to say that we should abandon our tradition's sense of God to rectify this problem, though that would not be a novel suggestion. And yet, how can we honestly build a world that is more just and in line with the heart of the gospel, if that heart beats in a body whose actions and history seem to go against our values and the work we want to do. I think the only answer is to go back to the text. When Jacob sets out on his journey, we read that he is an alien in the land the opening passage has him alone at nightfall in the desert with nothing but a stone as a pillow. True, he has just received his father's blessing, but in an immediate and material sense, he is alone, possessionless, and separated from home before his dream occurs. And yet, 
after his dream, what if this has changed? Same land, same rock, same desert journey, same lack of company. The only thing that God has changed in the scene is Jacob's perspective. It is Jacob, not God, after all, who makes a monument from his pillow of stone. Jacob, who grasps a new reality, the whole of which is present to God already, again and always. It is Jacob who renames Luz. It is Jacob who experiences revelation as a dream of colonization. Surely the Lord is in this place, he cries, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord, my God, he realizes, is with me in this foreign land. For someone in Jacob's tradition who understood both the Canaanite gods and the God of Abraham as dwelling in particular lands, this was an incredible revelation. But it is important that we recognize that it is not his dream that made it so. His dream opened his eyes, but as Jacob himself said, God was in that place before he understood that reality. This was groundbreaking for Jacob, but God, who is unbounded by chronological time, God, who is above and below and through geography, God, to whom all things are already revealed, did not need this dream to solidify whether or not the lands of Canaan were available as a dwelling place. When the Lord says to Jacob, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you, we read that Jacob is afraid. Perhaps he was afraid at the greatness of the promise, but what seems more likely to me is that Jacob was afraid of revelation itself not the words he heard in it. Whenever the veil of ignorance is lifted from our minds, what was foreign becomes familiar. And what was familiar, that is our ignorance, can make us feel like aliens in a land removed from God. We are not afraid of Revelation's new reality so much as we are afraid of our past ignorance. Revelation shows us that we can be wrong. Revelation shows us that we do not know everything. But in an attempt to flee from newly revealed ignorance, we often scramble to conclusions about our newfound claims to truth. We force vision into absolute fact, smothering the greatness of free and living truth, which is always beyond our grasp. We understand perspective as description rather than a decision about the way things are. We've spent our reflection in the book of Genesis, the first book of Hebrew scriptures. But now I would like to turn to the other bookend of our Bible, the book of Revelation, that wild and winding account that closes the New Testament. In my experience, we don't talk about this book very much in the United Church. I wonder if this is because in popular understanding, it has come to represent an apocalypse that does not seem to affirm the eternity of life. But I invite you to consider the definition of apocalypse, which in the original Greek means unveiling. In the book of Revelation, all creation swirls out of itself into something new. There is death and dying in this passage. But do we as people and as Christians not know that death is part of life? Do we not know that change is the very stuff of creation? Our tradition tells us that it is not death and dying, but stagnation and pride and greed that is the opposite of life. 
When we ignore the need for recreation, we do not see the ground of creation itself, which is always shifting and forming new possibilities. Revelation shows us that it could always be otherwise. Revelation shows us that the impossible is just what hasn't happened yet. Herein is one answer to some of the struggles presented in this reflection. May we, like Jacob, stumble through our ignorance towards God's promise up ahead. This promise, this revelation will fill us with fear. It confirms that we each have only ever known a fraction of the truth, but this promise will also hand each one of us our inalienable birthright that is the ability to change. The only price will be that we relinquish what we know about the way things are for the way things could be. This promise is the promise of life. May we rest in this promise so that we may no longer fear and hide from our own ignorance. May we rest in this promise so that the decaying institutions of oppression may die and make way for what is life-giving and new. May we rest in this promise so that we may rise from unimaginably holy dreams. May it be so. Amen. Our next hymn is found in More Voices, number 82, Bathe Me in Your Light, another beautiful arrangement by Andrew Donaldson, and I think this is one of my new favorites. Please join in. As we begin our prayers, be still and open yourselves to experience the presence of God. Creator God, we give you thanks for your creation, for the beauty of nature, for resources of food and energy for our use, for friends and families, 
for every child your gifts of new life and hope for the planet. You have given us stewardship over this creation, and we see that our stewardship has not been a faithful one. Give us strength as we struggle to both will and work for a creation renewed, a planet healed and held in your gentle grace. God of justice and peace, we pray for those people and places experiencing the trials and tribulations of war, drought, famine, natural disasters, the global pandemic, and many forms of injustice. In silence and aloud, we name them, committing ourselves to pray and act to address their needs. We pray for peace, for justice, for the sharing of the earth's abundance with all. Comforter, we pray for those of our community who are especially in need of your care and healing at this time. Silently and aloud, we name them. Barb Lloyd and family, grieving the death of her mother, Emily Elizabeth Lloyd. Sister-in-law of Barb, recovering from a serious head injury. Linda Padfield, grieving the death of her brother. Family and friends of the Reverend Jong Bok Kim. Carolyn Lemon. And the continued recovery of Sarah Brionis Clark. Holy One, we confess that too often we have not matched our words with deeds. Good intentions have faded under the pressure of busy lives, family and work responsibilities, and other concerns. Give us insight to see the needs that we can address. Give us ears to hear your call to action. Give us strength to hold fast to our commitment to the vision of a world renewed. And give us faith to experience your grace, a grace that ever holds us in love despite our failings. We pray for Shining Waters Regional Council, of which we are a part. And this week we name Ardtrea United Church, Aurelia, Mayfield United Church, Caledon, Sharon Hope United Church, Sharon, and Trinity St. Paul's United Church, Toronto. And now let us pray with the Church in Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Rwanda in words prepared for the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity in 1993. Lord, you call on us to pray for our enemies. Have mercy on those who are disposed to do us evil and who divide your church. Deliver us, Lord, from every temptation. Have mercy on our lack of belief and our wavering faith as we travel the path towards the unity of your people. You are our God, and we want to always be your people under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Amen.